Okay, so uh, we have a few questions, questions now. So the reason we have the questions after lunch, because if we did meditation straight away, people would start nodding the after lunch. So yes, what have we got? How does one get out of depression? How does one get out of depression? The best way is not getting into depression in the first place. In other words, to see it coming and just to know that if it carries on that path of overwork or negativity, it will just occur again. Number two is uh, an example of that. When I first went to visit my family in London about 30 years ago, uh, in the months of November, December, January, February in UK, many people get depressed and it was called SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder. And it was quite easy to see why, because the sun never came up until about 10 o'clock in the morning, and it went down about 2 o'clock, it's in the northern hemisphere, it's cold, it's grey, it's drizzly, it doesn't even rain properly, it is all just very, very depressing. Everybody, and the people don't wear bright clothes in that weather. It's all grey hats and grey scarves and grey overcoats and grey shoes. Even the girls all grey all over the place. All the buildings are grey stone. All the, the bitumen is grey and even the favourite tea at that time of the year is all grey. Everything is grey and miserable and depressing. And so no wonder people get depressed at that time of the year. It's dark. So what they did, just to get people out of depression, simple thing. They took all the people who had seasonal affective disorder, put them in a brightly lit room, and put on Hawaiian shirts, multicolored trousers or skirts, and they pl played loud hip hop music. And everything, the senses were just so, so uh, uh, excited that they got out of depression. It was just this poor sense of bleh. They didn't have anything else but bleh. And they soon their mind for bleh. And a little bit of sort of stimulation that made them happy. Just the same that sometimes people come on meditation retreat. And after lunch, bleh. So that's where Ajahn Brahm has to raise his voice and to modulate your voice. So sometimes you're speaking loud, sometimes you're speaking not so loud. That way that people can hear me many different tones of voice and it means it's interesting and you end up not getting uh, depressed. So simple. So that's one thing. Just find some, some interesting things to do. And one of those things is people get depressed because they think they're worth nothing. So go and do some charity work. And one piece of charity work you can do is to clean up after the uh, meditation day at the BSV. <laughs> do something. And that means that you're actually out there putting energy into your life and making it happen. Interesting, that is a very good antidote to depression, community work. You meet other people, you actually get inspired, you're doing something really useful for others, and that really makes you really, um, really energized. A bit of meditation also helps. If that doesn't work, obviously the doctor. I don't want to sort of take all the work away from doctors. Otherwise all the doctors who come to the BSV will have no money to give any donations and <laughs> we'll be really stuffed. <laughs> no, go on, carry on. Yeah, okay. Next one. This one's got um, two parts to it. How, first, how is the loss of mindfulness explained as soon as we talk to a meaningful other? And then second... How is mindfulness maintained with empathy at the same time, or is it the same? Yeah, of course. A meaningful other, you're meaningful to yourself. Which is one of the reasons why it doesn't matter who you're talking with, or even if you talk to yourself. Do you talk to yourself? Is that crazy? It's not crazy at all. Because, you know, I'm a monk, I we'll always wake up and I'm the only person there. And so I always say, good morning me, have a wonderful day. And I don't get up and say, I've got to get up and teach the Buddhist Society of Victoria people. To say, 
I don't want to do this. I say, yay, woohoo, another lovely day at the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Yeah, and when I go to bed at night, I say, ah, have a wonderful night, Ajahn Brahm. See you in the morning. <laughs> it always works. It works to see me in the morning. So that way, at least, is somebody I'm always with. And that way, you don't lose mindfulness when you're with the meaningful other. It doesn't matter who you're with. You're always with somebody. And that is with you. Yourself. Or somebody else. As I said the other day, the most important person in the world is the one right in front of you. And sometimes you close your eyes and, and the one right in front of me is me. The most important thing to do is to care. <laughs> Does, you know, monks aren't allowed to hug anything. And it's just, like I say, you having a hug, you know, hugging your friends and hugging this person and that person. So I decided, what can I do? This is really unfair. Ah, this one person, the Buddha allowed me to hug. <coughs> Myself. Come on. Those of you a little bit depressed, come on, give me a... <laughs> and it works. You get all these wonderful endorphins coming from your body again. You feel really good. And I never catch anything which I haven't already got. <laughs> so that way I'm safe. I think I told you I do have a disease. Contagious. That's right, happy Titus B. You heard it correctly. Not hepatitis, happy Titus. Happy Titus B for Buddhism. And of course, you know, that if you haven't got hepatitis, for those of you who do have any diseases, check your blood type. The best blood type in the world? B positive. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got B positive blood type, yeah, you're cool. <laughs> okay, actually I'm A, a plus. So anyway, I should have got B plus. I thought A plus was you know, highest. Any, you know, the test you have in school, I think A plus, plus is the best, but no. If you're in school and you get B plus, that is the best. So I tell your teacher, yes, be positive. Anyway, come on, next one. I work with many adults who have had trauma in their childhood, like your dad. What should I say to them? What should I say to them is just, there is just to give them that confidence in the space. What you can do for them is take them for a walk in the forest. Or you can take them outside and put them in the recycle bin. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if all that trauma you could knock out, put it in the recycle bin and fill it up with some good stuff. Unfortunately it's not that easy and also there's something terribly wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a bit of trauma. In other words, when you go into the forest, take them for a walk in the forest and ask them to find the most beautiful tree in the forest. The old beautiful, most beautiful tree in the forest simile again. When you go into the forest, no really, do this, go into the forest, find the most beautiful tree and you'll find the most beautiful tree is all twisted and bent and crooked and fat, like me. <laughs> <laughs> It's not your idea. Look, I just, there's one thing, there's many things I will never understand in this world. And one of those things I just will not under, ever understand is why people take photographs of me at this age. <laughs> I can understand when I was young and fit and handsome, but now when you're fat and old and ugly, I don't know why people take photographs of me at this age, but there must be something like the, the most beautiful tree in the forest is the one which is twisted and bent and crooked and, and damaged by life. And those are, they're the most beautiful trees. You get one which is perfectly straight. No, what you would think is the most perfect tree in this whole forest, like a super tree. Just like supermodels. You know supermodels? They don't exist. Because, you know, there's many supermodels. Someone said that Kate Moss, she's supposed to be a supermodel. She's a Buddhist. She goes on retreats. And so one of my friends heard that, that Kate Moss was on his retreat. So he joined on. 
guys. You know, that's what. That <laughs> and so he paid all this money to go to this retreat. Not really so interested in meditation, but Kate Moss, yes. And he's looking around, which one was Kate Moss? <laughs> and he couldn't see her. And it was explained afterwards that a supermodel is like just a blank screen on which through lighting, through makeup, through airbrushing, you can create this, this uh, fantasy image. But in real life, no one even notices her. She's very plain looking, apparently. So that's actually interesting. Supermen, superwomen, what actually are they? It's just the creation of the right lighting, the angles, the airbrushing, and all this other stuff which, which uh, stimulates people's idea of perfection. But in reality, the sorts of trees you would like to be around are not the perfect ones. They're just all knobbly and damaged. So take a person around to a forest and explain that to them. And they realize the most beautiful trees in the forest are not the so-called straight ones, they're the crooked, bent, damaged ones. Just like you. So I often say that if people think they're the they're damaged. Number one, you belong. You belong in the wonderful, wonderful forest of humanity. And number two, quite often, you're the most beautiful tree in the forest, the one I like. So don't try and straighten yourself up. Don't try and shave off all the damage. I never see a tree wearing makeup, dyeing its <laughs> leaves. It's just what it is. <laughs> so that is another way of looking at sort of trauma. Don't be ashamed by it. Celebrate it. Yeah, come on. I have an image of myself as being a kind, loving, generous and warm-hearted person but my partner does not have that same image of me. Yeah, surprising. I am, <laughs> I am finding that I keep defending my past actions, which my partner does not agree with, because they are consistent with that image and to protect that image I have of myself. I actually feel that I am now a victim of this image of myself, despite how wholesome it appears on my end. How do I break down this image I have of myself in a wholesome way so that I am no longer having to defend my past and future actions? Thanks. Yeah. Well, it's great when you don't have to prove that you're a kind, sensitive person. Now you can do whatever you want. And, you know, you get really mean and selfish with your husband. And he just, you say, well, this is what you want me to be. So I'm just doing this sort of compassion for you, husband. <laughs> in other words, we do have an image of ourselves. And one way of, doing, of, of swapping that image is actually getting a, getting a video and videoing yourself. And see if who you think you are is who you really are. In the, an image. Like a reality check. But I don't know the images of who you are. It's best not to have any image of who you are at all. So that you're not constrained by this, you know, trying to live up to some sort of image of yourself. It's much more liberating when you can be anybody. That's why uh, my old stories. When I was, uh, when I was young, fit. Actually, I'm not that bad. But anyway, that when I was, uh, I was. We always used to do heavy work at monasteries. You know, that's why those monks, you know, from Bodhinyana Monastery, you go to. NBM, that's our monastery down there. Oh, they work really hard. They're trained to work hard. You know, and that's one of the nice things why they very, make very, very wonderful monks to start places because they can mix concrete and they could do plumbing and they could uh, put on roofs and they're wonderful. It's actually free labor for the Buddhist Society of Victoria. And you get some monks from Bodhinyana to build an NBM and they call it the BBC the Bodhinyana Building Company. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cheap, efficient, and very uh, cost effective. But anyway, I was building and I love concrete, and mixing concrete and just pouring concrete. I don't know something about concrete. And it's that's some really like boy stuff. But any girls get into concrete as well, so it's not gender specific, they really get into it. And 
when I was just mixing some concrete and getting really dirty, you know, smashing, uh, throwing concrete all over the place, splashing here, splashing there, and my robes were just really dirty, and my face was splattered with concrete. And I went to my room to get a shower, and as I was trying to go to the shower, a visitor came. And this is not putting down Sri Lankan women, but I don't know. This happened to be a Sri Lankan woman. And she just was obviously very high class and rich. She had a very expensive sari. And she had bangles on. You know the bangles people wear at this time? And it honestly it had so many bangles, it was dingling from a distance. I really thought it was the ice cream truck. <laughs> <laughs> it's not putting down anybody. It was just... You know, that's what it sounded like. And when she came up, she said, I'm looking, I'm looking for a monk called Ajahn Brahm. Do you know where Ajahn Brahm is? And thinking very quickly, I said, well, if you go to the, the room over there, you probably be down there in about 10 or 15 minutes you know, for lunch. And so quickly went, had a shower, got changed, went out, and I talked to her and just gave her a wonderful, nice little in introduction about the monastery and how we were working hard and... and and give us some Dharma teachings. He was so impressed. He said, oh, that's a wonderful, it's got a wonderful monastery. You're a great monk. But, she said, if you don't mind me, I've got just one request for you. He said, well, what is it, madam? He said, well, on the way here, I saw one of your monks, and he was very badly dressed. <laughs> he was really dirty, and it's not really nice to see a monk dressed like that with all the the stains all over him, and so oh, really, you saw that? Oh, I, I will, I will talk to that monk later, madam. <laughs> oh, very good, well done. <laughs> and I wasn't lying. I already mentioned I talked to myself. <laughs> and all it, and she never knew it was me. And it's wonderful. You can actually just do all sorts of that stuff, and you can actually just—you don't have a self-image to protect. So when you don't have a self-image to protect, you're far more relaxed. You can make mistakes. You can laugh at yourself. You can admit everything about yourself. Mistake, oh yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have told that joke. I always get, is Cora here today? No, good, because she always complains about my jokes were a bit on the edge. She did, wow. Things are, that <laughs> but she didn't like the one about the, the postie. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, you can't please everybody. If you want to know the poster joke is, ask her tomorrow. She said, no, nope, I'm not telling you. No, no, she's a very lovely person, Corey. But anyway, that it's nice you can be whatever. Relax. Always be good and kind and, and uh, keep your precepts. But your self-image, you can just let it go. Because... My self-image is like, it is like an image, it's not real. It's in other people's perception. Interesting aside, when Ajahn Chah passed away, many years ago, he was a famous monk, and we, uh, at his funeral service, there was this obvious discussion. What did Ajahn Chah really teach? And we're having this discussion, and I said, no, he didn't teach that, he taught this. No, he didn't teach that, he taught something else. No, he... And there was an argument developing amongst the monks. What did Ajahn Chah really teach? And then my predecessor, you know, Ajahn Chakra, you know, he said some very wise things, and he said, there's as many Ajahn Chahs as there were monks, disciples who knew him. And that just completely stopped the conversation, because it was really wise. So, even Ajahn Brahms, when I die, what was Ajahn Brahms? Many, many people have different ideas. And just, which is the right one? None of them are right ones. You have the image which you think is the most helpful. Which is a wonderful way, so you don't sort of say, my self-image, what you'd be remembered by. I don't know, not my problem. And so my self-image is not my, it's your problem. <laughs> okay, anyway, there we go. Try okay. something else. Hi, Arjun Brahm. When I start meditating, I feel like some spirit or a ghost, uh, I think it um, walks past where I meditate, and I yeah. feel like it is not letting me meditate and wants to disturb me. I usually meditate for a long time, but this started happening recently. 
Please tell me a method to get rid of this thing happening. Ah, next time, because ghosts and spirits, they can be very useful and very powerful. So first of all, tell that spirit just to stop for a moment and tell you the lottery number which is coming up next week. <laughs> And if they don't tell you the lottery number, tell them to get lost. <laughs> What's the point of having a spirit if it can't do what spirits are supposed to do? What type of spirit ghost do you think you are, you hopeless, useless, just bunch of dark energy? <laughs> Scold the ghost if you can't get a lottery number out of them. And tell them to get out of here, what use are you? Girls what happened in here we go, the nice stories. In uh, the, one of the monasteries in the north, it's actually Ajahn Tate's, no, not Ajahn Tate's monastery, it's one of his branch monasteries. There was this uh, meditator, he was an Aussie guy, and he, no he wasn't, he was, he was English, but he, he migrated and stayed in Australia. But he was in this monastery which was renowned for ghosts. And he was meditating one, he was getting tired, and he leant against the wall and put his leg out just to stretch. And he, you know, would, I don't know they could say putting your leg, but this was real. Someone tugged him on the foot. And so, you know, he felt it very clearly. And he thought straight away, it must be some heavenly, some very positive um, spirit, you know, getting him to be a bit more, more um, energetic and not be so lazy. So he said, thank you, and then carried on meditating. But then it came in later on, and it kept on annoying him. Until the point came, it, it came in, he could recognize it, because it always was accompanied with a very bad smell. That like smell of something rotting. And he realized it was a bad spirit, one of the ghosts. And then, eventually, one day, it came in, he could smell this nasty smell, and realize this, this spirit was coming in. And so he decided to Golden spirit. Right spirit, you sit down here and you meditate or you get out of here, okay? That's it. No more messing around. Meditate. And the ghost never came back. Because <laughs> it's true. The spirits or the ghosts, if you look at the hierarchies of beings in Buddhism, they're lower beings. The, the ghost realm is way below the human realm. So you have much more power than they have. And the simile is, why is it that elephants are afraid of mice? What can a mouse do to an elephant? What can an elephant do to a mouse? Smash, squash, that's what an elephant can do to a mouse. But what can a mouse do to an elephant? Nothing. What can a ghost do to a human being? Nothing. Human being to a ghost, you don't realize the power you have. So if, if there is a real spirit, Tell them, out, now. Or, if that doesn't work, tell them, if you carry on like this, I'm going to tell Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> oh no, no, please don't do that. No, no, <laughs> no, please. Because <laughs> you've got much more power. Send them away. This has two parts. What does Rigpa mean? And how does one quiet one's mind when in a relationship one seems to know, be aware of more than the other. Okay. What well, Rigpa was that organization started by Sogyal Rinpoche, who was pretty much disgraced. Mm. So that was, this is all part of the, the current um, uh, Western people especially, even Asian people, coming to terms with the fact that it doesn't matter how charismatic your teacher is, you must make sure that they abide by the rules. In other words, that if you're a, certainly if you're a monk or a nun, you know, one of the rules is the no hanky-panky rule. I don't know what I mean by hanky-panky. No, no sexual misconduct at all. So you don't see monks sort of having any intimacy, you know, with either female relationships or male relationships. And also the 
in some traditions, they're not monks or nuns, they are lay people. They don't have monastic rules in some forms of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, but they still call themselves Rinpoches and Lamas. And sometimes that just because you think they are spiritually advanced, it doesn't mean they can abuse you. So that's one of the reasons why that you know, it's about time that people wake up and think just submitting to a guru would mean sort of some spiritual advancement. It doesn't mean that at all. It's usually just more abuse. And it gives religion and spirituality a bad name when those things happen. But if you're in a relationship and you know more than your, uh, your partner does, it really depends exactly what you know that he doesn't know. And the uh, way to find out is just go up to your partner and just say, partner, I know all about it. <laughs> and if you know where that goes, <laughs> that was recorded on the talk yesterday. <laughs> okay. As a parent, we try so many ways to overcome stress with our kids, but we always go back to facing the same levels of stress. We teach, ask our t kids to walk on the right path, try our very best to safeguard them from wrongdoings, but they continue to walk on the wrong path. As a parent, how can you deal with this? Number one, that's par for the course. I remember visiting my brother. He has had two children, uh, my niece and my nephew. And so my niece and my nephew used to call me Munkle. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like it. <laughs> and my brother was doing some work and I was talking to my nephew and niece. And they started, what was our dad like when he was our age? And I told him all the naughty things my brother did when he was young. And they were really interested, they were fascinated in this. <laughs> that, that's the sort of stuff my dad told us not to do. And he did that, really? And then my, my brother happened to walk into the room and he really scolded me. He said, I'm trying to teach my kids to be good kids and you're teaching them all the wrong things which I did. Well, you did that, be honest. It turned out all right, yeah, but that's not the point. <laughs> it was the point. And I remember this story, this is uh, from Islam, Sufi Islam, in Iran, was it 700 years ago. This, uh, all these wonderful stories. Mullah Nasruddin, he had a son and he would help him in his business and the business was uh, trading, this time he was trading salt and so he, he put the salt bags on the donkeys and they would go from one region to another you know, trading salt and when they crossed one of these really narrow bridges, you know, you know not like the Westgate Bridge or anything, but just really narrow one, one donkey wide <laughs> when when the donkey was you know because it had a heavy weight on it when it was leaning to the left he would tell his son push it to the left because he knew his teenage son whatever dad said he would always do the opposite <laughs> so dad said push it to the left and the son would push it to the right it's leaning over to the right push it to the right son, and you push it to the left. And that way they'd cross the bridges without losing any donkeys or salt. Things went very well. But then what happened one day, they were crossing a narrow bridge, the donkey was leading to the right, leaning to the right, and the father said, I'll push it further to the right son. And he pushed it to the right and it fell in. He <laughs> said, what are you doing that for? You know, you always do the opposite of what I say. And the son, don't you realize father, it's my 20th birthday today, I'm no longer a teenager. And that was 700 years ago, in Iran, in Islamic culture. <laughs> Kids haven't changed. <laughs> so, the most important thing to teach your kid is actually kindness, forgiveness. Sometimes you've got to let them go out there and just make mistakes. Trust them a little bit. Sometimes they'll fall on their face and get into trouble. But just that's what people do. 
They have to learn from mistakes. So guard them, but don't over guard them. Give them a sense of a bit of freedom. And say, I trust you, son, you're gonna or daughter. You know, be careful. You know, if especially if girls are going out, drugs, alcohol, you know, boys can talk you into anything. So remember you're worth much more than that. Trust. And teach people to have that goodness from inside. Otherwise you can't just follow your kids all over this planet and just whatever they do, you need to give them a bit of trust. Just like how many of you sometimes disobeyed your parents? I know one person who disobeyed his parents. Thank goodness he did. <laughs> the Buddha, he became a monk. <coughs> okay. After my last retreat, I became annoyed with a colleague at work when I returned from a retreat. What and why and how to handle it? Well, I hope it wasn't my, was it my retreat. If it was, uh, don't go on my retreats anymore. <laughs> Usually it's the opposite. Usually when you go home after a retreat, you're already kind and peaceful and blissed out. And you, what's that story? This uh, man in Perth always wanted to go on a weekend retreat, just a weekend retreat. His wife would never let him. Say, too busy on the weekend, we've got too much to do. You've got to take the kids to sport, we've got to go and do our shopping, we've got to fix up all the, the gutters, it's going to rain soon, we've got too many... No, you can't go. Okay, he said, I'll stay and do the work. Next time, can I go on a weekend retreat? No, you can't go, we've got to... Mother's coming, you've got to go and sort of uh, take the car in for a service, you've got so many things to do, no, you can't do it. Okay, darling. And he was such a compliant uh, husband. And then one day... He said, it's a weekend retreat, can I go to a weekend? Okay, you go and be selfish, you go on your stupid weekend retreat, leave me with all the shopping and the kids and everything else. He took that as a yes, and he went. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she said, said yeah. But what happened next was amazing. This is a true story. When he came home from a retreat, he was such a wonderful husband. She noticed just how he was really nice and compliant and worked hard and caring, didn't talk so much or complain so much. It was such a change, it's like taking your car in for a service, it runs so smoothly afterwards. She was so impressed that the next time there was a retreat, he sent told us he never needed to ask. His wife gave him the money and sent him off. <laughs> no husband tuning. <laughs> a wife innovation, whatever it is. But it, sometimes if it really is a good retreat, then you'd, and you follow the instructions, in other words, instead of doing your own thing and just striving, getting more fed up and tense, you'll find that it works very well. And you go home a much better person. There was this man who turned up at the psychiatrist office. So what's wrong with you? And he says, you know, sometimes, doctor, I feel, I'm, feel like I'm a marquee. Like what we've got at the back over there. Other times I think I'm a, a teepee. And the doctor said, I know your problem. It's very common these days in Melbourne. You're too tense. <laughs> I'm too, too tense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try another one. <laughs> a squirrel. You know squirrels. Squirrels go to the psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist, what are you doing here? And the squirrel said, well, as soon as I read, you are what you eat, I realized I was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the girl who went to the same psychiatrist <laughs> and said, what's your problem, madam? He said, I'm a dog. I think I'm a dog. Oh, wow, get on the couch. No, I'm not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, Dear Ajahn Brahm, <laughs> I was diagnosed with a serious health condition. When the doctor read the report, the golden words came to mind, to mind were, don't think, why me? You are the one who taught this to us. Thank you so much, Arjun. Your great advice gave me the strength to face that challenge. Dharma works.
Yeah, of course it does. Yeah, I told you so. You doubted me. I'm offended that you doubted me. <laughs> yeah, it does work. No, well done. Because that's it. If you say why me, you get really depressed. And that just makes it much worse. So no need to get sort of depressed about... This is one of those other nice little bits of Dharma. Put your hand up here if you've never ever been sick. You've never been sick. Anyone ever not been sick? So I can take it you've all been ill from time to time. In fact, if anyone put their hand up, they'd never ever been sick. You'd be a medical, uh, medical anomaly. <laughs> and you'd probably be taken to the university to have tests done on you. Because it's really weird that people don't get sick. And so it'd be something very abnormal about you. And so what that means is actually it's very normal to be sick. So why is it when someone does get sick, we say, Doctor, there's something wrong with me. I'm sick. That is not Dhamma. There's nothing wrong with being sick. Stop stigmatizing sickness. Just uh, embrace your sickness. Go to the doctor the next time you feel about to die and say, Doctor, there's something right with me. I'm sick again. So, anyway, that takes a stigma. And people actually do that. I don't know about here in Melbourne, but certainly around Perth, the local doctors, as soon as someone comes into their surgery, say, Doctor, there's something sick with me. So there's something, something right with me. I'm sick again. Oh, you're another one of those Adam Brahm disciples, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that changes the whole idea. Number one, if you do feel a bit poorly or a bit off, you don't take it as a personal failure. There's nothing wrong with you. So you just go up there and just go to the doctor and say, can you help? Nothing wrong with me, it's part of life. Or you don't feel bad about yourself. So you go up there and say, Doctor, something right with me. I'm sick again. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Imagine, because if you're sick, then you can take a day off work. But don't get sick on the weekends. <laughs> that really not the right time to get sick. On a <laughs> Monday morning, Tuesday or something, when it's time to go to work. Great time to see, especially if it's like a football match on or something you really want to see, or you want to go on a retreat or something, I don't know. Is that sort of cheating? <laughs> Okay, anyway, carry on before I get into trouble. Um, any advice on dealing with being pressured to break the five precepts? I recently accepted temporary duties at work and realised <coughs> after accepting that lying is a part of those duties. I haven't been asked to do so yet, but it's likely coming up and I want to avoid it. Oh, I'll just give up being a politician. <laughs> well, I don't know what the job is, but so many jobs people are expected you like. Which is really weird and strange, you're deceiving people. So that's the case, you know, it's, as a monk, you know, you always try to tell the truth and you don't want to disappoint people, so it's really difficult sometimes when people say, oh, I don't know, you know, can I see you afterwards, or can I please invite you to teach a retreat? And it might be like a senior monk, can you come and see, see Ripple Book Temple? And I can't say no, so I say, well, I'll think about it. I shouldn't actually tell you this trick. <laughs> and they say, oh, I know, yeah, you think about it, I want to tell you, I can't get away that easy. <laughs> That's not lying. I say, I'll think about it. And I've been thinking about some invitations for, oh, I don't know how many years. <laughs> I'm still thinking about it, give me time. Okay, it's about 15 years ago, actually, but, but yeah, but I can't lie. Oh, another thing which sometimes is difficult for, somebody comes up to me and said, oh, Ajahn Brahm, do you remember me? <laughs> now look, come on, give me a break. How many people are here? And, you know, sometimes you go to Sri Lanka and BMICH was about five or 6,000 people. 
And I said, I saw you at BMICH, do you remember me? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't be rude like that. So what I do these days, you know, somebody comes up to me and they sort of, you know, look a bit familiar. And they say, do you remember me? And I say, oh yeah, you're that, that, you're that person whose name I keep forgetting. Again, I tell all these people, I shouldn't tell you these things because it's all my tricks, you know, get undermined. So you say, yeah, I know, that means you don't remember me, do you, Ajahn Pram? <laughs> okay, Mum. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Can you please explain the meaning of spiritual materialism? Is that what some people do when they only meditate and seek enlightenment from meditation? Yeah, sort of, yeah. I think I get that, because spiritual materialism is saying, I'm more enlightened than you are, na 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 na. I got deeper meditation than you are, my teacher's fatter than, no, my teacher's wiser than yours is. Na 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 na. So, the story behind that great little story was, oh, it just happens to be, there's other monks do terrible things. Actually, not really monks' story, this is a lay story. Because there was this old auntie in Sri Lanka came up from the highlands to visit her children in Colombo. And the children, wonderful to see their mum or their old auntie. So what they did was they said, what can we get you, auntie? And their auntie you know, was a very good Buddhist, you know, since the time she was born. She said, I, I don't need anything. They said, ah, what if we sponsor you for a retreat? A meditation retreat. And there's this retreat happening at the time, somewhere around Colombo, where not just meditation, no, for about three or four weeks, not just meditation, but study as well. Meditation and study, study meditation. And at the end of the retreat, they will give you an interview and also a little test, at the basis of which they would actually assess your progress. And if you did really, really well, they give you a certificate. Just like being at university, BA, BA with honours, MA, PhD. And this was streamwinning certificate, stages of enlightenment, they gave them certificates. And this old auntie said, oh yeah, okay. So they sent her to this, you know, nice gift for the auntie reading to Buddhism, so she's meditating and studying, met, studying. And at the end of the four weeks, they came to her and said, Auntie, we've got wonderful news for you. We have this lay people doing the assessing, because monks shouldn't, well, some people do this, but they should never do that. These lay people said, wonderful news, Auntie. We've discussed your case, and we are in agreement that you have become a soul one, a stream winner. And now, and look, any Sri Lankans here, oh, they'd, what, what, if they could know they were streaming, that's, oh, they're just so happy. It means only six more lifetimes and they'll become fully enlightened. Well, they're just on the path, there's no way they can actually go back from there. And they think, oh, that's the minimum this lifetime, I want to be a so one. And so they gave the so one certificate. Congratulations, auntie, well done. And she got really upset and angry. And they couldn't understand. Why are you getting angry when you know, you've become a stream winner? You should be so celebrating. It's one of the most wonderful things to be on the path towards enlightenment. You should be overjoyed. And she looked at them. It's amazing. Only ways that I can, I can, like a Margaret Thatcher stare. <laughs> like a Pauline Hanson. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, she said, you don't remember me, do you? And they said, no, I was here about five years ago and you gave me a non-returner certificate. <laughs> you have demoted me. <laughs> so non-returner is the third stage of enlightenment and they demoted her to the first stage of enlightenment. <laughs> so no wonder she was angry. <laughs> And that story got around, and that's the end of that scam. So spiritual materialism is like, look how big my house is. Look how flash my car is. Look how big my monastery is. Look how many monasteries I've got. 
My disciples are better than your disciples. My path is faster than your path. <laughs> that spiritual material, that really is totally against the teachings of the Dhamma. We don't compete, we work together. So, <laughs> when it comes to spiritual materialism, it's all the same we do. I'm prettier than you are, I've got more money in the bank than you have. Look at my house, look at my salary, how much do you earn, ba 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 ba. All the things we measure people by their material possessions, and now people measure themselves by their spiritual possessions. It's one of the reasons why the Buddha said, if you do gain any stage of enlightenment, especially for the monks and the nuns, you never let anyone know. Don't tell people. So you never know who is a real stream winner, the real enlightened beings, the ones with the real psychic powers. You never know. It could be this quiet little nun just sitting on my right. Who knows? <laughs> You never know. It's those quiet ones. <laughs> They're the ones. To <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, online. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um. So, Evie from the USA asks. I am feeling a lot of resistance to the idea of compassion due to my experience with abuse. How can I learn to be truly virtuous instead of fighting my irrational urge to protect myself? Oh, sometimes it's not irrational to protect yourself. So first of all, compassion to yourself, first of all. So when you learn compassion to yourself, or when you feel strong enough, if you've been really beaten and you're weak, you need to have... Um, to basically get your inner strength coming up first of all. That's why when a person's gone through like a fever or a disease, it takes a long time to recover, to get your strength back. You do little, uh, some physiotherapy, some exercises to get your muscles strong again. Now you need to do some, some spiritual, um, spiritual uh, physiotherapy, for like spiritual therapy or something, just to get your mind strong again. To feel good about yourself, number one, whenever someone's abused, it's not your fault. Never blame yourself. It's amazing as how many people blame, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have been there, I shouldn't have let that happen, why did I let that happen, the warning signs were there, I should have seen them. No. Please, get your own inner strength up first of all. Forgiveness, inner strength, uh, meditation, feel good about yourself, get some peace some happiness, and then, once you're strong, then you can go back on the football field and start playing again. If you don't play on a football field with a broken leg, it needs to be healed first of all. So kindness, compassion to yourself, that's really important. And afterwards you can make your choice, you know how you're going to deal with these problems in life. Inner strength first. Uh, Camillo from Colombia asks, uh, how can I reconcile my deep love for art and music with the concept of letting go that Buddhism teaches? Thank you. For art and music, you have to let go a lot. Is know this when meditating or when even just giving a, a Dharma talk, some of the best Dharma talks you can never plan. You can never actually just think out what you're going to say. Sometimes you do get, I feel this sometimes, you get into a zone. And the zone of the Dhamma just comes out. Sometimes I get surprised at what I say. So where did that one come from? Wow, that's amazing. And honestly, this is how it feels. If I try and force it, judge it, make it happen, you always interfere with it. And the same with meditating. You get into the zone. You don't force it, you let go. And the mind just takes over and just brilliant meditations. Same with art, with music. I've read and, oh, one of the old ex-monks, he married an Indian classical dancer. 
Uh, no, she was top of her trade, so that she was on the front cover of glossy magazines. You know, she was well known throughout India. And so I asked her, how can you dance to such a high level? And she said, I practice, 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 but when I actually go through the dance, I just disappear. I forget everything I was taught, and I'm just, I get out of the way and let the dance happen. And I've heard that so many times, whether it's in sport, in gymnastics, in music. You have to get out of the way. You practice, 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 practice. When you perform, you disappear. And just the piano plays you. And it's the same with art. Great artists, they pick up the brush or whatever, and they just see how it evolves. They don't force it, they don't interfere, they just let it go. They've practiced beforehand. They've got all their technique really down pat. Practice, practice, practice. But when they paint the masterpiece, and it goes. So then, that is real art, really the highest quality, the highest quality of uh, painting, music, whatever, comes when you disappear. You're not there anymore. You let go, and it happens. Yes? And Doge from Japan asked about how to deal with boredom. With boredom. Oh, I know all about boredom. Boredom, you must do a study. Find out what boredom really feels like. First of all, in your body. Remember I was saying this morning about anxiety. When you're anxious, it manifests on your body somewhere. So you're bored. Find out exactly how boredom feels. Where does it manifest on your body? And just exactly where? Does it spread out of your body? Is it in your head? And Describe what boredom feels like. If they were in front of me, I'd ask them, demand of them, two-page essay on what boredom feels like. And really get into it. Do an in-depth study of boredom. And is it boredom to say the same? This is all the time, but does it get worse? Does it have its peaks and its real depths of boredom? How long does it last? Is it any chur? You know, just it has its its really deep borders and sort of average borders and not so bored. Or what causes it? How does it work? How does it affect you know your your um, your your health, your your um, eating habits? How does it affect your interpersonal relationships? Really get into boredom. As you get older, do you get more bored? Is it just a, a problem with the young? When you interact with other people and listen to Ajahn Brahm's stories, is how does boredom react to that? Boredom is one of the most interesting things to study. And when you take an interest in boredom, <laughs> you got it. It's not boring anymore. <laughs> so boredom is not something out there. It's the attitude we have. Make it interesting. And Dasana from Toronto asks, during a 10-day Vipassana retreat, I had a lot of nightmares. Ooh. One specific nightmare even repeated a few nights. Mm. Are they another form of Sankara coming up to be released? No, they're just messing around. So, if you do have nightmares, for goodness sake, keep a paper and pencil next to your bed and write them down. Because I've heard that Hollywood is really looking for new scripts. <laughs> All the old stuff they've used up so many times. So, if you get a really good nightmare, I mean a really scary one, that could be this wonderful script that can make you millions of dollars because they get one uh, like walking dead or vampires uh, there's one years ago called Buffy the Vampire Slayer that must have been a guy who had that weird fantasy dream and he wrote it down Buffy, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and that became a sort of a, a million dollar franchise so just if you do get these dreams write them down Welcome them. Get all the details and send them. Send them to who's 
Um, who does, does, sorry? Spielberg, no, he's just old hat. He needs somebody who's, who's more, Stephen King. Okay, now I get to know what Frank reads at night. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> no, just, so in other words, give it a positive slant. Number one, don't be negative about it. If you can be negative about it, then people think, oh, just, it's something which we cannot use, I'm a hopeless case. And you'll find out it comes up again and again and again, because it's a negativity it leaves behind. And so if they are nightmares, it just means you're not being peaceful. So just relax a little bit more. Don't force it too much. Learn to be kind and peaceful. So if you have any dreams at all, they're dreams of peace, of calmness, dreams of stillness. Oh, what wonderful dreams they are. Because you take into bed with you just the attitudes of your day. Shows you actually what you've been thinking about during the day. So just let it go. Very good. People don't usually have any dreams on my retreats when they go to bed. They just do all their dreams while they're meditating. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they do, they're fantasizing. <laughs> okay, anything else on the, on the internet? Uh, there's one more. Um, since some Buddhists practice Kung Fu, does this mean the Buddha is okay with self-defense? Or are you mm. supposed to abandon martial arts as a Buddhist? Well, the, over in, um, in mostly the Singaporean group, they actually did a clip of... Kung Fu Panda. And they said that Kung Fu Panda had a lot of similarities with Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> I want <laughs> what similarities. <laughs> so, but real Kung Fu, real martial arts, it takes it much further than any aggression. Oh, there was one monk, he's a very good, good monk, good friend. He's over in one of the English monasteries. And he, uh, he was, you would never guess that this uh, monk was a uh, second Dan black belt karate expert. On the outside he was just so soft, so lovable, but he was second Dan black belt. And the reason why he gave that up was he was a contest with another second down blank, black belt, a contest. You know, this was really you know, very, very powerful stuff. And then as he was fighting, it was actually a girl, black belt, same level. He said he flipped into this, this samadhi state. He was so focused and he put down all his defenses and he let this girl hit him as hard as she wanted, no defense. And it didn't hurt, no bruising. It was like a samadhi state. And he said it really blew his mind. This, the, the girl fighting him, just hit me. <coughs> really hard, but he was invulnerable. And it, was, it really shook him so much, just the power of what meditation can do that he gave up his, his um, karate and became a monk to actually explore that meditation much deeper. I remember telling me, this, he said it was the weirdest experience. You know, so it was very high level, dangerous stuff. And instead of defending himself, his state of mind just made his body invulnerable. Weird. Now that is real martial arts, when it gets to that level. You don't have to hit someone. You don't need the power because you have the samadhi power. So that's where that's supposed to really be leading to. So if you want to take it to that level, fine. But the level which harms other people or hurts other people, no. <coughs> but that's why they have to be very careful teaching 
karate in the army. As soon as you salute. <laughs> I guess it's any joke you salute in the karate corps. <laughs> oh, come on, it's a stupid joke, I know, but <laughs> you'll laugh. Okay, that's it, is it? No, I should actually, yeah. Yeah, it should be 2 o'clock now. We can have a break uh, for 15 minutes and then we come back and do some meditation. Because questions, please apologize overseas, but the, and then some of the questions I'm sure I never answered you know, fully. But sometimes with the audience here, you, you give as much as possible. You know, you sometimes get too serious and you have a, have a bit of fun sometimes also. So we try and balance it so it keeps you awake. In sp- inspired and on the subject of meditation. Very good. So, now a letting go break. <laughs>